Very good morning from wherever you're watching NTV. This is a special talk show where we are going to be discussing sound management of uh, chemicals and associated waste in Uganda. It is a continuation of a two-part series of broadcasts, one that began on uh, Saturday where we spoke to the officials uh, from uh, National Environment Management Authority, the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries, as well as the Uganda National Bureau of uh, Standards. The uh, Paused on uh, the latest interventions in the management of chemicals in the country and today we shall be digging a little bit deeper into the implications of uh, chemicals on uh, human health. Joining us on uh, the show this morning is uh, Patience Nsereko, the Principal Environment Inspector at National Environment Management Authority. Many thanks for joining us. On Saturday, we spoke to the executive director of the National Environment Management Authority. We also spoke to Andrew Othiano. He's uh, an official in charge of uh, standards at uh, the Uganda National Bureau of uh, Standards and also the ministry, an official from the Ministry of Agriculture, Animal Industry and Fisheries, John Mwambu who is in charge of uh, agrochemicals. It was a comprehensive discussion where they espoused on the state of affairs in terms of how badly chemicals are affecting our environment, how they are being managed. We understood or rather uh, came to a conclusion that sound management of uh, chemicals is something that uh, has to be entrenched more, especially by uh, sector players across uh, board. Today, it's uh, a continuation, and we look at uh, the implication of some of uh, these uh, chemicals that are very hazardous, and as they are used on a daily basis. We understood, for example, that uh, at household level, there are a range of chemicals that we come into contact with, from food to uh, cosmetics, soaps, and uh, so much. It was something that opened eyes, especially to whoever was watching, about the implication of some of these uh, uh, hazardous chemicals and how they're used. Today, could you take us through what we believe or what NEMA and all other agencies believe are the chemicals that are to be given attention because they are either more hazardous or we don't have much information on how to use them? Okay, thank you. Uh, the moderator. Thank you. Too. Yes, uh, chemicals appear, like you've mentioned, when mm -hmm. we interact with them in various sectors, even in our whole households. Uh, even water is a chemical. I mean, it's H2O. Yeah. But there are certain <laughs> chemicals which are categorized as hazardous. Yeah. And they would fall in different, um, at least they would fall in one of, the either of these categories. It would either have uh, physical hazards, mm. be harmful in terms of physical hazards, or it can have uh, health hazards or it can ha have ha hazards on the environment. That's right. Uh, just to expound a little, when you talk of the physical hazards, mm. you'll have flammable solids. By the chemicals will also appear either as liquid, solids, or in gaseous form. Yeah. So you'll have, for instance, a flammable solid, where uh, ammonium nitrate, for example, uh, okay, it's not flammable, but it's in, uh, it can be an explosive, mm -hmm. but it's in a solid form. Mm -hmm. You can have flammable gases, like the gas you use uh, for cooking at home. For cooking at it's home. Definitely yeah. It's definitely a flammable gas. Mm -hmm. You can have something that when you we react with other, sub when you place it with other substances, it can react and probably cause fire or explosion. So these are physical hazards which can harm us and uh, property. They also uh, self-reacting, that mm -hmm. if you expose it, for instance, to heat or other uh, kind of... Uh, catalyst that would help it react, then it could react and cause uh, uh, fire or other other yeah. hazard. So that's a category of physical hazards which you need to take care or to, um, take into account. Mm -hmm. But we also have uh, health hazards, where, for instance, we have uh, something that could be an irritant to the eye, for example, mm -hmm. or it can be se you can be sensitive to sensitive to skin. Normally they'll tell you, for instance, wear gloves when you're touching this because it may either yeah. uh, cause Corrode burning or corrode something on the yeah. skin. Then we'll have those that could be irritants. Yeah, some people may react to it. So they'll say, for example, if it's in, um, uh, you know, use this doom at home for spraying, mm -hmm. some people may be irritated to that. Yeah. Uh, there are some where th it goes even further and they could be carcinogenic. Carcinogenic means that it has potential to cause cancer, cause cancer. in the long term. Yeah. There are others which can be mutagenic, means that it can affect your, your genes. We have an example of Minamata. Yeah. You've heard of that disease, Minamata disease 
where children were born with uh, deform deformed uh, either arm limbs or foot or, or limbs or like eyes. that. So those are mutagenic substances. There are also those that would be able to uh, affect your uh, s s functioning of your systems in, in the body, either your, your hormonal systems and the mm. like. So those are health, some of the health hazards. But also we have environmental hazards where a chemical would be able to, for example, uh, harm fish. And that's why they would warn you on uh, the label for a product, mm. not use it, for instance, near an aquatic environment, okay. because it has the potential to harm aquatic life, the fish or even the, the, the plankton that's in the, in the water. But then there are also in the in category of environmental hazards, where we talk about bioaccumulation. Mm. Uh, remember on Saturday's program when the ED was talking about fish being able to eat certain of some of these uh, heavy metals. And then amplify them. And then amplify them. That's the case that happened with Minamata in, uh, in Japan, where mm. because of discharge of um, a lot of mercury, mercury contaminated waste into a water body, okay. the fish were able to take on this mercury and it accumulates in their fatty tissues and then we eat it and it can affect us. Okay. So hazards can fall in these broad three categories of um, uh, physical hazards, mm -hmm. health hazards, or environmental hazards. And normally, uh, we should take caution and try to identify those hazards mm -hmm. and follow the information that is provided to prevent those hazards from... Okay, hazard is... Uh, maybe I just need to talk about that. Mm -hmm. that, it's, that it's an intrinsic property of the chemical. So we should prevent that hazard from happening. You know, that, that what, it's what they say could happen. If they say it's a flammable gas, yeah. you have to prevent that from happening. From hu yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. How about uh, acute toxicity? Acute toxicity, okay, there are two days, either acute toxicity or chronic mm. toxicity. Acute is that you, in very small doses, mm. a chemical will cause harm. Uh, okay, the best example I can use is say, uh, uh, if you took... Um, Okay, for, for the public, maybe let me say if you got acid poured on you, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, the effect is immediate. Okay, yeah, sure. Exactly. But then if you took, or even small doses of uh, hazardous chemical would affect, for instance, burn your lungs or your mm -hmm. liver, it's an internal organ. But then if you took it in certain small doses, you may not, that is a chronic now, we may not be able to see the impacts immediately. Mm -hmm. They come after a long term. You'll have someone saying they developed a, a lung disease. We've had lead, for example, the mm. one you have here, lead in paint or lead in petrol. Mm. People exposed to lead for long, it has the capacity to affect their respiratory system or other systems in their bodies. Okay. So it's important that uh, we, we don't ignore the chronic uh, uh, effects. Yeah, take them into account as well as the acute effects. Uh, should this message be taken uh, very seriously, especially by builders, contractors? Exactly. You spoke about paint and yes. then there's petrol. Exactly. Uh, just take us through what yeah. could be the level of exposure that most are currently uh, taking in. Well, uh, I guess I, I wouldn't say much on level exposure. That is more mm. Ministry of Health more would Minister have the information yeah. on that. But uh, if you, the example is the giving of builders, mm. cement, for example. Mm. Many times we are, we are not uh, wearing protective um, mm. respiratory yeah. equipment okay. when we are dealing with cement. That fine dust has the ability to go into our respiratory systems and it may cause uh, d uh, different impacts depending on how much someone is exposed. Mm. So when you talked about, for instance, lead in paint, lead in paint, they mainly say it mainly affects uh, especially children mm. because uh, they, they easily can, you know, touch paint they and touch peel it off and, and put it in their mouths and that kind of thing. So there's a, l a lot more concern mm. regarding exposure of children to lead in paint. But I talked about lead in fuels. Mm. The, when combustion happens and the engine runs, what comes out of the fumes? That's why now the world is going towards unleaded fuel, such mm -hmm. that you can reduce the emission of uh, lead into okay. the environment. Uh, the official from uh, the Uganda National Bureau of uh, Standards, Andrew Othieno, mm -hmm. on Saturday spoke about the importance of uh, labeling, but many times the information that is on the labels is mm -hmm. either not clear, sometimes not understood, and the sheer complexity of the safety data sheet. For example, on average, if you are buying a chemical at uh, the store, mm -hmm. it's very unlikely that you'll be able to read the entire uh, data sheet as presented mm -hmm. because of either the size of the text, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it comes in English, sometimes it's in uh, Chinese, sometimes in Japanese. So people tend to just ignore and say, okay, let mm -hmm. me have an idea because Chris used it the other time in these quantities. I think I can also use it within mm. these quantities. Isn't that problematic? 
Um, yes, thank you. Indeed, just like it was mentioned last uh, on Saturday, mm. there is what we call the globally harmonized system for classification and labeling of chemicals. This system came in place because previously um, chemicals were labeled according to where they are produced. Yep. A chemical is produced in Japan, in China, mm -hmm. and it's labeled as such. However, we all know that chemicals move across boundaries and they're used uh, across right. the world. That's right. So when it moves, say, from China to Europe and maybe Asia, mm -hmm. there may be difficulties in communicating this information. And therefore, uh, there was established an, uh, what we call a globally harmonized system for classification and labeling of chemicals, yeah. which allows, it's a standardized system, yeah. harmonized across the world, for how chemicals should be labeled, depending mm. on their hazard characteristics. And what normally is in this label, um, for example, you'll see a pictogram or a symbol. Mm. I don't know if many, probably the public has seen a symbol on the fuel trucks. That's the easiest yeah. example. Where you have the square. That is at uh, Hatari Danger. Uh -huh. <laughs> so now you have the symbol mm. or the pictogram. Okay. Then you have a um, uh, um, hazard statement. Mm. For example, you'll have a symbol saying flammable. So it could either be a flammable liquid or a flammable gas. Mm. So that, that, that the pictogram should also have a word uh, to, guide to guide people. Because someone may not easily understand the yeah, pictogram. Sure. There is one that is usually confused a lot for um, when you're talking about a health hazard. It has a picture of it's someone and then something kind of exploding in the <laughs> from the center yeah, of there. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so that's something that says a has health hazard, beware when you're using beware. it. Yes. Okay. So it has the symbol, the and then the signal also. Mm. So it, it tells you uh, what what you should what what to look out for. Mm. Um, many times people are not reading this information and the easiest example when you go to a drug shop, you'll always find that label safety data sheet. It's yeah, called a safety data, safety sheet, data sheet. In the in the container. The unfortunate mm. bit is that many yeah. times we got the an average safety data sheet of yes. a drug like mm. a syrup, if for example you're dealing with uh, the wave of coughs and uh, uh, influenza among the children. When you pluck it out of the mm. box and then you open it it's a whole no a lot of information no, yes the Not text is mm. really small exactly. so sometimes i think shouldn't there be uh, a mechanism mm. uh, for example if these products come onto the ugandan market from uh, foreign countries there should be a simplified data sheet for example, my grandmother in Butaleja mm. cannot read that safety data sheet. Yes, that's yeah, true. But they need that chemical or drug, for example. Mm. Mm. This should be simplified. Well, the unfortunate thing is that that information is required. Mm. It's required by different entities. I'll give an example. If you bought a drug from the clinic mm. and uh, went home and took it, if you reacted to that, the first thing you'll be asked if you go to a health facility is... Did you take anything? What did you take? And maybe how many amounts? What did you eat? Mm. And if uh, the, the drug is not very familiar to the health worker, they can go into that safety data sheet and get information. Mm, the safety information. data sheet not only identifies the chemical, but it also gives information on, for example, uh, how should you use it? Yeah and who should not use it, I think you've seen that, yeah, don't use it right. in these circumstances, uh -huh. but also gives information in terms of emergencies. Mm. If something happens, what should you do? So the safety data, it has about 16 areas. Of course, yes, you're like, you're right. Many mm. of us never read that, yeah, all that don't. information there. Sometimes it's However very small. However much we prime ourselves as good readers. Yes, <laughs> but then it is, it is important to different players. Mm. If we go back to the chemicals we use in our homes, it may not necessarily come in a safety data sheet because you, I mean, you buy Doom mm. and it's just one tin. Mm. There'll still be some critical information at the bottom of that tin along with where you find the symbol, the hazard mm -hmm. symbol and statement. Yeah. There'll still be some information on don't, don't use in these circumstances, maybe leave open windows open and the like. So it's important that whatever small information is provided, mm -hmm. we're able to read it as, as uh, the user of that chemical mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and take caution. Okay. What I see here is uh, what you call a pictogram. Yes. Uh, that uh, kind of labels the extent of harm and also classifies it as such. Mm -hmm. However, for the benefit of the viewers out there. I don't know whether it can be as clear as possible to see this is the pictogram they refer to. However, when I read here and I see GHSO1 mm. explosive, GHSO4 mm. compressed gas, yes. GHSO7 harmful. Mm. Well, we can go on and read all of them. However, the average crease mm. when they find something GHSO5 corrosive there's a lot of thought mm. and that could affect how I perceive this particular mm. information. I do not know, should all 
these uh, pictogram and hazard statements or signals be written in English? Can't they be simplified in Luganda or uh -huh. any other language like Lunyole? Well, um, <laughs> the thing is that it, the, the information should be understood mm. by the user. Uh -huh. And uh, GHS, the main language of communication is English uh, across. Of course, you'll find some in Chinese and yeah, the like, because sure. th th some of the manufacturers are in those countries and they'll therefore make the information uh, usable for the, for the people within their countries. Uh -huh. uh, however, like I said, the pictogram uh -huh. is meant to help someone have a picture. Have an idea. Have an idea mm -hmm. of it. Avoid the danger. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You'll have sometimes ex an exclamation mark, uh -huh. in which says this is harmful. So the pictogram... Uh, it's a combination of all these things. The pictogram, the hazard statement, the, the signal. It should be able to at least pass on a message to the user. Mm. But um, like I've said, where the chemicals are manufactured and used in a local market, you can't find some in their, in their local languages. In Uganda, mm. unfortunately, it may not be possible. I mean, mm. you have so many languages, English, Luganda, yeah, sure. and the like. So normally the language of communication is English. Okay, that speaks to the challenges that come to uh, the communication of some of these uh, hazards. The lack of a poison information center. Mm. I do not know whether there is a concerted effort to roll out some of these centers across the country. Inadequate capacity to manage cases, particularly in the rural areas. Uh, some cases are detected too late. For example, the Uganda mm. Cancer Institute has often uh, said that cancer is detected very late. So it means people are interacting with these chemicals or getting to uh, suffer the hazards and the effects and then they realize it a little bit too late. Mm. The Minister of Health uh, should be in position to uh, have this particular matter addressed. However, I think because it's a concerted effort, multi-sectoral mm. approach to fighting the misuse and the implication or rather the impact of chemicals has never been brought on board and if it has been, what exactly is being done? Yes, when uh, there's an emergency, mm. someone accidentally, for instance, takes in a chemical, like a child could use a container and take in a chemical, uh, normally what should happen is that you should have, normally the chemical, the, 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 one, the guidance would be that either rinse or uh -huh. wash or something like that. But uh, countries... With soap, another chemical? Well, if it's hands with soap, but okay. normally they rinse with a lot of water, mm. clean water. Uh, what happens is that normally we're supposed to have what is called a poison information center. Yeah. That any health facility should have access to this information in that uh, center. Mm. For instance, it will provide a list of chemicals that are used in the country and um, provide antidotes. Yeah. If someone takes this kind of chemical, what should be the kind of treatment that is there given to help them recover? Unfortunately, we have tried to establish it. It's supposed to be a Ministry of Health uh, undertaking. Initiative. Yeah, sure. Um, we have tried, it's there, but it's not really what, what, we, sh what we want. Mm. A lot of cases happen in rural areas that are probably not captured. Yeah. Uh, the information is not captured and easily accessible to the health workers to use it. So it's one of the things that we would like to work with Ministry of Health. Of course, Ministry of Health, we have DIGAL, which is the Government Analytical, Analytical Laboratory, because mm. these do analysis, and uh, NEMA and other players to be able to establish such a center feed it with a lot of information and also establish um, what would call outreaches, mm -hmm. uh, links also with other health facilities to be able to feed this center with information that can be used. Uh, another thing would be would be able to share information as inst different institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, as NEMA, what information do we have on hazardous chemicals uh, in, the w in the country? Especially they talked about last Sunday, Saturday, we talked about uh, industrial chemicals. Yeah. Many times people don't bother to understand which is which uh, yeah because in, in a facility for example in an industry mm. the owner will bring in chemicals and ask the workers to use them to use them but the workers may not necessarily ask what are these chemicals we're using what are the hazards we've seen it a lot mm. when you, someone is mixing some two chemicals and they've been asked what are you mixing and he says well i was told i was told to mix yes. isn't that so uh, a crisis it's it's, it's even a crime because it's we have another crime. law that that governs the use of chemicals in industry that is mm. the occupational health and safety act That's right. that has provisions for what sh uh, measures should be put in place in the workplace to prevent uh, hazards on to workers mm. so it's important that we have such a center that would help us, but most importantly that, because the center gets information from the community. Yeah. When I come to the health facility, I'll give an example. One time I had been doing a number of inspections and mm. I got a, a respiratory problem, the cough wasn't going. And the first thing the doctor asked me is where do you work? 
And I asked, but what is what 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 does it have to do with it? Uh -huh. Then he tells me, okay, yes, I think you got some something. You inhaled something that wasn't that's, right, uh, for right for you. So when you go to the health facility, you should be able to identify that okay, I interact with this kind of chemical more often, and therefore they can be able to help you, uh -huh. which many times is not the case. Okay. Yes. Let's uh, just uh, stay on the issue of uh, the poison center and bring in the aspect of, for example, if a chemical has expired, mm. I do not know what happens. Mm. There was a friend of mine who was asking what was no doubt uh, not a bad question, but well, silly. If mm. a poison or a chemical has expired, does it mean it does it can't do <laughs> what it was originally, you know, uh, manufactured to do? Does it become uh, harmless? <laughs> <laughs> On the contrary, it even yeah. might become more harmful. Oof, yeah. So that's why it is important that we follow the, mm. the, what, the, what uh, has been put on the, the information that has been put on the container. That's right. So the blanket uh, advice is if a chemical has expired, it yes. becomes worse than it actually It, it can Just become worse. Dispose it off. Some, of course, may it break down and not be as mm -hmm. effective as they were intended to be, uh -huh. but it's better to take the advice uh, provided by mm. the manufacturer and don't use it. Okay. Mm. That takes us into waste management. Mm. The revised National Environment uh, Regulations mm. Act for 2020 makes provisions uh, for management of healthcare waste. What are these provisions? Uh, what is expected uh, for mm. healthcare providers in this uh, regard? Okay. Yeah. Um, healthcare waste is of particular concern mm. because not only does it contain things like biological matter, but also could contain uh, chemicals with some of the hazards I talked about earlier, but also may contain radioactive material. Yeah. Uh, so a health facility generates quite a broad spectrum of waste yes, uh, that could be classified as hazardous, yeah. and therefore they need to take more care when you're handling it. As you did mention, the National Environment uh, Waste Management waste regulations, regulations of 2000, 2020 yeah now pay more attention to what we call healthcare waste. And it require, they require that any person who is generating healthcare waste should be able to characterize that waste. Characterize under what different categories? For example, we have the drug stores, the pharmaceuticals, even a pharmacy within a health facility mm. generates what we would call pharmaceutical waste. Yeah. The drugs that are coming off the expired, even expired drugs. Disposable needles. Yes, those yeah, those, those now are in fall in the shops. It falls, the shops. There are different categories. Ah, okay. You have the pharmaceutical waste or chemical waste, which is arising mm. from the chemicals used within yeah. the health facility, the, yeah. mainly pharmaceutical products. Then you have those shops that have been used to prick, take a blood sample, to inject. Those, and if you've gone to health facilities, I think you've noticed that now there is they give them um, containers to mm. be able to separate that. Separate the needles will be put in one container and then the syringe itself is put in another in container. Another, yeah. Actually, in some countries, even the syringe itself can be recycled because it's plastic. Mm. But then the shops are taken elsewhere taken most, elsewhere. most times for uh, incineration or proper disposal. We also have another category which could, as I mentioned, radioactive, mm. which can be um, uh, a challenge. I, it could be in small quantities, or it could be even a machine. We've had the uh, um, machines that are now obsolete, mm -hmm. and that's now where the Atomic Energy Council comes in, because they're the ones supposed to help um, either dispose of these machines, mm -hmm. uh, get, uh, it must, we don't have a facility in Uganda to be able to make those substances less harmful, and therefore it would be either the manufacturer who brought mm -hmm. it into the country so many years back, sometimes we find these people are no longer existing, or if the, the government is unable to find uh, the facility, you expect a private player to... If you were... Uh, because the world over, mm. uh, we have a principle called polluter pays principle. Polluter pays principle. Yes. Okay. When you introduce something that is harmful into the market or into the environment, you should, meet you the cost. should pay the costs mm. for disposing, disposing of that product or taking it back. And that's why there's a discussion now in health of how can we manage healthcare waste. We're looking at especially drug, pharmaceutical waste, yeah. where they're bringing drugs to the health center. In a short time, they've expired. they've expired. Then the health center has to deal with that waste. There should be under the planning for waste management, mm. some percentage that is put to waste, planning for, for drugs, sorry, for pharmaceuticals. There should be some percentage that's put to waste management, which many times does not happen. And that's why the uh, regulations now are saying, okay, categorize this waste such that you can know 
what waste streams go to what kind of management. Mm. We have these, I, I haven't mentioned the cotton swabs and other things that have been contaminated mm. with, with, say, blood and blood specimen. And Those ones are taken for incineration. You see, then for market calls, we have waste handling companies that can collect them also, and yeah, most of them also are taken for incineration. Mm -hmm. Radioactive, I've talked about Atomic Energy Council, which yeah. has to come and help the facility deal with them. That yes. deals with uh, the radioactive health uh, care waste. Yes. Okay. The licensing regime by the National Environment Management Authority for mm -hmm. waste handling. Mm -hmm. We see so many companies have come up. Uh, mm -hmm. What we mainly see is the household waste. But I think for hospitals, do we have a licensing regime? And if it is uh, operating pretty smoothly, how and who are the people that it's licensing? Yes, um, those regulations I mentioned, the waste management regulations, require any person who is who is who is who intends to handle waste, mm -hmm. any kind of waste. Any kind. You're talking of the municipal waste generated mm -hmm. in the cities. You're talking of the healthcare waste we've healthcare been mentioning. Waste. We're talking about industrial waste. Uh, any person who intends to handle waste is supposed to pick, get a license from the National Environment Management Authority. Um, this license is issued for whatever stage of the chain Mm -hmm. for waste management that you're in. We have people who have come to us for license for storage. Yeah. They'll be generating a lot of okay, so, uh, waste in small quantities and they would want to first store it for some time before they can get a, another person to take it away. I'll mm -hmm. give an example of oil waste, uh, the, the um, used oils generated f say from the hydropower dams. So we shall give a license for storage. The license gives conditions on how we should store that waste. Mm -hmm. We have people who are involved in the transportation and I think you've seen some of the trucks going around, uh, both for KCCA, that uh, for municipal waste, mm. but also for healthcare waste, where you shall have, for instance, for healthcare waste, we require you to have a, okay, it's a box body, a, a container that is enclosed and mm. lockable. Unlockable. Yes, that you can be able to put the waste in there and close it off and take it to its destination. Mm -hmm. So that's a transportation license. We also have a license for treatment. When you talk about incineration, you're treating waste all... Um, Burning it to, for instance, with pathogens, the swabs and all that that have uh, some matter that could cause disease. Mm -hmm. You want to burn that and then you can deal with now the ash. So treatment facilities, we also issue a license. Mm -hmm. Then finally disposal where we have a landfill, mm -hmm. then that one also comes to us for a license. Okay. Yes. Uh, talking of the landfill, we've uh, had uh, stories, uh, numerous stories mm -hmm. about uh, a crisis at uh, Kitezi. Mm -hmm. Kites is an area just off uh, Gaza Road where mm -hmm. most of uh, Kampala's municipal waste is uh, disposed of. But the inability to, for example, segregate waste at the source means that Chitezi gets just about every aspect of, wa of uh, waste from uh, the medical, household and industrial mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. especially because within an industry mm -hmm. uh, there are people who are disposing of waste that could be ideally classified as household. Mm. What is NEMA's role in ensuring segregation of waste at the source is up to the point and then disposal is also followed to the letter? Well, first of all, the public needs to know that waste management, the primary entity responsible for waste management, mm. okay, is the individual, yeah, the individual, but in terms of the uh, government, it's the local government or the city urban authority. Mm. They are the main entity that is responsible for ensuring that waste is properly managed within their jurisdiction. If you give, for instance, Kampala Capital City Authority, they are responsible for ensuring that there is segregation at source and therefore providing the facilities that would as, uh, enable that segregation at source. Okay. Uh, also along the transportation route, there should be able to, someone should be able to ensure that that segregation is maintained. The challenge we have had is that many times when people try to segregate waste, mm. when the collector comes, <laughs> They just put everything, everything back into is put in yes. one. But the good thing is that we have people who are coming in to see this waste as a business. Mm. And therefore, they're telling people to separate, for instance, bi biodegradable matter. Yeah. And that can be taken for compost composting. Mm. As NEMA, we've supported about 12 local governments across the country to establish composting plants. Mm. That the vegetable matter that comes with waste mm -hmm. is uh, taken through a, a, a few days of uh, composting to generate manure. NEMA's role in this is to provide support. Mm. Just like I've given an example of the, those projects, the 12 projects across the country. NEMA provides support in terms of uh, developing uh, ordinances, for example, okay, okay. in terms of training the waste handlers or even the local councils. 
in terms of licensing, mm -hmm. you know, before you issue a concession to carry waste as a local government, mm -hmm. then NEMA should have issued the license to that okay. entity. Okay. So ne that's really the role that NEMA plays. The principal role is with the local councils. All right. Uh, Ms. Patience Insereko, Principal Environment Inspector at the National Environment Management Authority. They're giving insights and perspective on uh, chemical waste management. And of course, uh, under we are understanding whether what we are doing in the country is sound or not and what can be done to improve so that the impact of chemicals on uh, human life is uh, lessened. We shall now go into a short break, but do stay with us. This conversation continues right after that. Of a two part series of broadcasts, we are looking at the implication of uh, chemicals on uh, human health. How you can avoid getting into trouble because of either misusing or simply uh, indulging a little bit too much in the use of some of the chemicals that you come across uh, in food, in uh, cosmetics, and just about everything that uh, you use at home, at the workplaces, and the uh, social settings. I am Chris Higeni, and of course on set I have uh, Patience and Sereko, a principal uh, environment inspector at the National Environment Management Authority. Before we went into the break, we had uh, spoken about the challenges that uh, you are facing and of course other sector players in uh, bringing into this circle of uh, interventions on uh, chemical management and uh, sound waste disposal. I have something that I'm particularly concerned about industrialists and these ones uh, seem to have a knack for avoiding the pay the polluter pays cost issue uh, so much so that they are happy to do whatever it takes to ensure they are not caught. Is NEMA doing everything it takes to catch them? Uh, yes, indeed. We, we, we are doing our best. Yeah. But like uh, my AD mentioned on Saturday, mm. we don't want to go with the, the stick before we use the carrot. Before we use the carrot. So many times we've approached these entities. First of all, we do regular monitoring. Mm. We go to them to check their compliance. We have equipment to do the uh, um, checks on site. We That's can right. determine, for instance, water quality, the basic parameters, pH and dissolved oxygen, for example. We determine on site, and we can be able to engage with you and say, look here, the effluent you're discharging is not meeting the standard, and therefore you like to, aff to affect the, the water body and the like. Yeah. Um, and indeed, we have done this. We, we, we've done this with some entities. I'll give an example of Skoll. Mm. Actually, we use this example a lot because a score, um, being the that sugar is Sugar Corporation, Corporation of Uganda, Uganda in Ugazi. Mm. We sat with them and engaged them and showed them they had done a lot of investments uh, in other things mm. and still there was a smell in Ugazi town. Yeah. But they made a few adjustments here and there and were able to improve and they, they were even able to buy their own equipment to, their mm. own, to do their own monitoring to check that they are, they are, they know they are in compliance. So we usually want to use that compliance assistance mm. approach before we bring out the stick. Indeed, we've done, we've brought out the stick a number of times, just that sometimes the public may not know about this, but we've, give, we've, we've taken uh, action as, as an authority, and we've had some of them, we've had them improve. Mm. Uh, th our, our, our goal is to have that consistent improvement or maintain that, mm. but you'll find that sometimes something, uh, there'll be a ch few challenges, say if uh, electricity is uh, not working well, their air pollution equipment is, is run by electricity and mm. there'll be a problem, okay. yes. Oh, that uh, makes uh, you give uh, the Sugar Corporation of Uganda Limited uh, a near clean bill of health. <laughs> no, that's not what it means. Okay. It means that we've worked with we've them worked to with improve. Them and yes. cooperating. So it's very imperative that uh, most of the industries and other sector players do cooperate with the National Environment Management Authority, especially in the disposal and use of uh, some of these chemicals. I do emphasize that because we know that in the rural areas and some of the industrial establishments where these uh, factories are, the average Ugandan doesn't care much about whatever is going under or near their houses or whatever effluent is being disposed, they tend to assume that uh, we shall overcome that. And besides, everyone shall die. But NEMA should be able to come in and help uh, the average uh, Ugandan on that. Let me come to the hierarchy of uh, controls, according to what we have here. How is it applicable to sound management of uh, chemicals and waste? I see a lot of words. <laughs> 
elimination, mm. substitution, isolation. Mm. Could you take us through the hierarchy of controls? Yeah. Yeah, before I take you through, I just want to mention that many times people, when you talk about um, preventing hazards of, from chemicals, mm. they run straight away to providing personal protective equipment personal protective, yeah. without necessarily eliminating the hazard. And that's where the hierarchy of controls comes ah, in. Ah, sure. It, 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 it has Before you do, yes. just emphasize that people run to, to providing gear safety equipment uh -huh. for the worker, the individual, the individual, and forget to remove to the actual hazard. The, the hazard. So you go and get the gear to prevent whatever you want to prevent. However, the hazard is the still... The hazard still exists. Okay. What we should focus on as in chemicals management, mm. number one is eliminating, eliminating the actual the hazard. hazard. Okay. I mean, if you have a car that has a problem, you won't drive it because you know it could cause an accident. Mm. So first repair the car, first then get onto the, the road. Then, yeah. So this is what it means that if I have, for instance, um, I can do work without this chemical, mm. I can proceed without this chemical, then I can eliminate it. Eliminate it. I mean, I mean eliminate the, the actual hazard that that chemical poses. Mm. The world has talked about uh, certain chemicals that are regulated under uh, conventions that are internationally agreed that this chemical should come out of supply. That's right. DDT, for example, is it's regulated. Uh, the use is regulated because that's the, that's the thinking that countries can uh, deal with malaria mm. or malaria causing vectors without necessarily using DDT. Mm. So then we eliminate that hazard that would appear for both human health and the environment. Sure. So when you come from elimination and you cannot do without this chemical then you have to find a way of substituting. Mm -hmm. You get another chemical with less hazardous properties but can achieve the same uh, functionality. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen that, uh, for instance, uh, dental, dental amalgam, when you talk about maturity, mm -hmm. there are other options to use in filling your tooth. So we substitute, we get the steel with the tooth filled, mm -hmm. but then you substitute with something that is less hazardous. Less We've less. had that even in when we are talking about the mining sector, they're trying to remove mercury and mm. put use something else. So that's, that's the second level. If you can't eliminate, then you substitute, substitute with something that is less hazardous. Mm. If all that cannot happen, then you may have to engineer the hazard out. Okay. Meaning that you shall focus on protecting or preventing someone from being exposed to that hazard, that particular and hazard. and the, the difference with engineering with engineering and PPE is that when you're engineering a hazard out, then you're targeting the whole work, all, all of us who are working in that environment, mm -hmm. not necessarily just an individual. For instance, engineering could be that um, a process can be designed that there is no interaction directly with an individual. I'll mm -hmm. give an example of say cement manufacturing. Yeah. We know that there's a lot a lot of dust generated. Or even in an industry, generate um, manufacturing uh, agrochemicals or doing mm. repackaging and refilling. We can make all the processes automated and just have one person standing at the back of a screen mm. to see that things are moving properly. So you're eliminating, I mean, you're, you're, you're engineering the hazard out to, to avoid the person from be interacting directly with that hazard. Mm. So it will be in a room, the equipment will all be in a room and everything is happening. Um, all, they are, all they have to do is look at the screen and see that things are moving well. If uh, you've tried all this, you've been near the hazard out, but you still need to take some other precaution, then you get into administrative controls. Mm. Administrative controls are operational procedures, rules of do and don'ts, don't enter this place without equipment. You know, you've seen, uh, I want to use a lot of example of health because every one of us has visited a health facility. Yeah, sure. Where you have, uh, when you send, they send you for an x-ray, mm. You'll notice that those rooms have certain signs, don't enter without this. Don't. So if you're being keen, keen, you have noticed that. So those are communicating hazard information mm. is one of the administrative controls. You communicate to someone that this is a hazard, so take caution. If all that has finally been done, but you still need to take some, there are some residual uh, impacts that the chemical could pose, mm. that's when then you talk about personal protective equipment. Okay. And the personal protective equipment, unlike the other four levels are mentioned up is only protecting the individual and you have no control over what the individual does we've gone to facilities okay you have less control not necessarily no, no control, no control. Um, we've got to facilities and someone is given all this equipment they've given them the safety shoes the helmets the everything and the individual will still go ahead to work without this and when you ask them they'll say I'm uncomfortable in it you see so you have Being no stubborn exactly yeah. so you don't have much control on if this person will use the PPE correctly, 
it's better to use these other controls where you're directly in charge mm -hmm. and you can minimize the, the exposure to the hazard. Okay, just yes. to emphasize for our audience, uh, the hierarchy of uh, controls in the sound management of chemicals and chemical waste are, if you can note, please do, elimination, eliminating the use of the chemical, substitution using safer chemicals or a safer form of the chemical, isolation, separating people or property uh, from the chemical by distance or barriers, engineering, adopting physical controls that eliminate or reduce or suppress, administration, incorporating safe work practices including good housekeeping and then adoption of personal protective equipment or PPPE that of course you know uh, there could be masks, there could be gloves and uh, so much within uh, that uh, particular realm. Chemicals in Uganda is, I think, uh, something that could be not well understood, so to speak, but we deal with them, of course, uh, on a daily basis. Let's take this conversation to the lowest level. You go to the shop, buy yourself uh, shoe polish, buy yourself uh, Vaseline, we now have a lot of Vaseline on the market and uh, some say this is for men and the other is for ladies. I don't know exactly how the, <laughs> the chemical differentiates that this is male skin, the other is female skin. Uh, I think this is a case of uh, information and uh, marketing. But this comes back to the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Are these particular uh, inconsistencies being addressed or it is something that you leave to the manufacturers or the regime of importation of these uh, particular chemicals? Well, um, just like UNBS discussed on Saturday, mm. standards are normally set by the standards right. body in consultation yeah. with the uh, interested uh, user d uh, department, for example, if it, uh, our agency. Mm. For example, if it's NEMA and we need standards say, for air quality, we shall consult. We shall consult. Yeah. Um, regarding whether standards are set for either female or male or like, well, mm. some chemicals react differently on depending on the gender type mm. i don't know what the case is for cosmetics <laughs> uh, I, I won't i really <laughs> won't comment on uh, whether cream is different for a male mm. or a female okay. but we do know that for instance because women uh, uh, because of their reproductive their nature could be exposed more mm. uh, and could probably give birth to a, pers a child who is deformed and alike to certain chemicals and therefore when industrial processes are being designed there are certain areas where for instance you shouldn't allow women to work, to work because it could affect the unborn baby or mm. something like that so those standards are normally set by uh, established by the UNBS and as NEMA we would consult with them if we needed certain standards set okay what mm. is uh, what is uh, NEMA benchmarking right now in terms of uh, the holistic approach to addressing uh, chemical waste management yes uh, just like it was mentioned on Saturday the National Environment Act mm. now recognizes or has provisions mm. for management of hazardous chemicals and it requires it uh, that NEMA establishes regulations to mm. for the management of hazardous chemicals especially to address the lacuna which is the industrial chemicals. Mm. We did mention that agricultural chemicals are already covered by the Agricultural yeah. Control, uh, Chemicals Control Act. We have the NDA Act that covers the drugs and mm. pharmaceuticals, but the gap is in yes. the uh, industrial chemicals. So now currently we are developing regulations that will cover industrial chemicals. The Act does of course provide for some chemicals which have been listed like lead, arsenic, polonium, mercury. Those are already categories of chemicals which uh, we should take uh, extra precaution for and therefore may require license to handle. But the regulations that we are developing will speak across, uh, will, will regulate the whole life cycle of industrial chemicals mm -hmm. from importation or production to storage, transportation, distribution, use and final disposal. The disposal partly is addressed by the waste management regulations because waste management regulations have, um, they speak to hazardous waste. Yeah. And so it's a bit covered in there. But which the regulations that are hopefully we're hoping that they could be done by maybe June and if they're endorsed by the minister, they could come into law. They will then require a licensing regime mm. to take effect for persons especially involved in the uh, bulk handling, uh, importation, transportation, distribution of chemicals. And of course, implementation of what we, I mentioned earlier, the globally harmonized system for labeling of chemicals. Currently, it's not really being uh, enforced yeah. because we don't have a legal framework for it, but we're encouraging it. But we found a challenge where we have pushed entities to only use chemicals that have full GHS labeling. 
they've come back to us and said on the market this is not being implemented. Now when the regulations come into force, that will be a requirement. If you put a chemical on the market, it should be labeled and packaged according to the GHS. Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, perspective. Just before we close, because uh, we are making the final bend, the mines in districts like uh, Namayingo, Movende, they, we seem to hear, we, or, or rather usually hear stories of uh, people, of course, after inhaling a lot of the dust and uh, the lead. I do not know whether there is a particular enforcement regime that targets the mines and the people, because there are many Ugandans, especially the low-income earners, many are youth who are in these mines deep, and if an 18-year-old uh, can work in the mines for seven years, by the time those seven years elapse, it's very likely that 18-year-old won't go beyond 45 years of age. I don't know whether there is a particular campaign or initiative that is targeting such uh, workers. Yes, indeed, we also regulate the mines. Mm. Of course, the biggest challenge is that there are so many small-scale uh, entities or persons uh, operating yeah, in there so it becomes a bit of a challenge but what we have done is to work with the local governments mm. who can go there more often and we've had uh, awareness campaigns in the mining areas but we've also had uh, where we've had to go in and probably stop some activities where the hazards are, are, are quite many okay especially when we're talking about there's a program we have on controlling the use of mercury in in mines mm. and we are trying to help them appreciate that there are other safer alternatives okay. to, to doing the mining but it, indeed it is true mm. being young and being in the mines there are many hazards there mm. uh, not just the insulation of the dust but also even the use of the mercury use of some of those uh, yes, chemicals in, in, in mining well patience and circle many thanks for the perspectives that you've offered on the sound management of uh, chemicals and associated waste disposal in uh, the country like i've just said we've been speaking to patients in circle a principal environment inspector at the national environment management authority i hope you have picked a few things that you can be able to put in place in terms of how you can be able to avoid the adverse consequences that might come from either misuse or overindulgence in some of uh, the chemicals that you come across on a daily basis. Thank you very much for your company. Have Chris again. That's it for now. Do stay with us. Programming continues here on NTV.